Ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, a lot of you know that a guy who really helped me a lot over the last maybe 10 years or so, particularly when I was first getting into dating and sex and relationships and all of that, was Chris from Good Looking Loser. Now, if you go to his website, you get this big error message all over his website, site offline. His website has been broken for about a year or so. And so something that I like to do on this channel is go over some of his old content and sort of read it out, respond to it, add my own thoughts, because a lot of these articles that he wrote, he wrote, you know, 11, 12, 13 years ago, and he has changed a lot as a human being. You know, he's now married with kids. I have obviously changed and evolved a lot as well. So let's get straight into it. And this is an article. It's called, What Do Women Want? They Have No Idea. Sexually Unavailable for Unexplained Reasons. This is a really nice article for those of you guys who get a little bit down when a woman turns you down or says no or rejects you or maybe she's taking a little while to respond to your text messages maybe you feel like you're not good enough for her this article shows you that women are human too and for any of you women listening this might make you feel a little bit better when you sometimes are a little bit irrational or you're a little bit scared or maybe you overthink things or you're a little bit neurotic when it comes to, you know, a guy replying to your text messages, etc. And this article is talking about women, obviously, but really this is an article about humanity. This is an article about humans and how sometimes we get a little bit scared we have a lot of fear and hesitation and reservations with dating and stuff like that. I literally just got off a coaching call with a guy who went on a date with a woman and he seemed to like her and she really liked him. And he sent her a text message afterwards saying, hey, I'm not really feeling the chemistry. I don't want to date and I don't think we should keep going forwards. And he explained all of this to me while we were talking on this call. And he said, do you think I made a mistake? And I said, the reason that he didn't go forward with her is because he's looking for something BDSM based and he likes BDSM. And so he said to her, do you like BDSM? And she said, oh, what's that? I don't really know anything about it. And he took that as a rejection. He's like, oh, she's not interested. When literally what she said is, I don't know about BDSM. Can you please teach me? Can you please explain it to me? And so I've had other clients that do the same thing. They'll have some little thing that they react to and then afterwards they go, oh my God, why did I turn that person down? So men do it, women do it. As you're going to see in this article, lots of times women might be turning you down for something that has nothing to do with you and they might just be nervous or socially anxious or anything like that. It's not always about you and it's not always a personal rejection. And seeing the similarities between men and women, seeing that we're all human, can help you not take dating and possible rejection and all of that so personally. All right, let's get into this article. Sexually unavailable girls, you could say sexually unavailable humans, don't even know why they are or aren't sometimes. A little bit of a preamble, blah, 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 blah. So he goes on to talk about some of the reasons why women are a little bit unavailable. But let's get to the good bit. This is some stories from some girls that he was friends with. And this can show you that it's not always because of you that somebody is turning you down. So here's two recent examples. I mean, not that recent now. This is like 14 years ago. But here is two recent at the time examples of two single girls that are seemingly looking to meet guys, but they randomly become unavailable, leaving everyone confused, including themselves. <laughs> Yes, lots of times men and women will be a little bit irrational in dating and then afterwards they go, fuck, why did I turn that person down? It was out of fear. The guy that I just did the coaching call with that I just mentioned, he's turned a couple of other people down out of fear. I did the same thing. I used to turn people down. This is, you know, 10 years ago. I turned down a lot of women because I thought they were too good looking for me or they were too interesting or they were too cool or I wouldn't be able to handle them or any of that sort of stuff. And so it actually had nothing to do with them. I just irrationally turned them down because I was scared. That's a very common human thing. So he goes on to say, just the other day, Chelsea and my roommate, Adriana, just got back from Trader Joe's. It's a grocery store. I appreciate that. I actually, as a non-American, obviously, I don't know what all of your stores and stuff. Are. I know a little bit from having coached a lot of Americans, but I appreciate that. I thought Trader Joe's was a grocery store. 
Chelsea is really cute, totally single, and is basically encouraged by all of us to go get some. Go get some, girl. Go slay, girl. What's funny on that note is any women listening know this, but lots of guys just assume that women are just out there having sex all the time and that it's only men that ever struggle with sex or intimacy or dating. No, I have plenty of female friends, Imogen, a couple of her friends, who haven't had sex in several years. And you might say, why? They could just have sex any time. No, not necessarily. They might have social anxiety. They might be afraid. They might have ridiculously high standards that they set for themselves or they set for men because they're really terrified of rejection. And so they're secretly setting their standards so impossibly high that they never have to go on dates. Plenty of men do the same thing. You know, plenty of people are incel by choice. So there's all these different reasons, but women often, or some women can go very long periods of time without sex as well. It's not just a male thing. He goes on to say, while at the store, according to Adriana, a really good looking guy was talking to them. Adriana playing matchmaker like always. What a wingman, hey. Look at this Adriana shit, good girl. She's probably like in her 30s or 40s now. She's probably married with kids, but good girl Adriana for 12 years ago. She told the guy straight up, I'm taken, but you're totally my friend's type. Go talk to her. Fucking hell, what a wingman. Turns out Chelsea and this random guy had a lot in common. They're both trying to make it in Hollywood. They're both from Texas. They even lived near off Melrose Avenue. There used to be a TV show on that in the 90s. It was called Melrose Avenue, right? They even had a common friend from the gym that the guy works at. The conversation went really well, but when the guy asked Chelsea for her number, she apparently said, no, I can't do that even though she liked him, even though she's single, even though she's available. On the way home and leading into the living room, when the girls got home, the discussion continued and Adriana couldn't figure out why in the world Chelsea turned this guy down. It didn't make sense to any of us. They were both attracted to each other, had way more in common than the average strangers, and lived nearby each other as well. At the very least, the two probably should have met up and had coffee. Chelsea's explanation made even less sense. I'm paraphrasing here. Yeah, he was cute. But I just couldn't today. Not today. Yeah, I liked him, but just not today. I don't know why I said no. Just not today, please. I know it's just a phone number. Not today. I can't do today. I didn't plan on giving out my number today. I don't know why. This is a very common human thing. Again, I have seen this in a lot of my male clients. I have seen this in a lot of female friends, friends of Imogen's, girls that we have dated together and that I've dated by myself before Imogen. There are plenty of people who act like this, who everything seems perfect, the stars align, it seems like you're going to be a great match, and for whatever reason, they just don't reply back to you, or they ghost you, or they flake on you, or they cancel plans, and they don't ever text you back. It's a very human, normal thing. There's a million reasons why, and we could get into all of that. There's a lot of things like social anxiety, fear, pressure, fear of failure, fear of success, all of that kind of stuff, worrying about getting too close to someone and being hurt. Sometimes you are such a great match with someone that they freak out over how great a match you are because they can't trust themselves and they're worried that they'll fall in love and get feelings and get heartbroken. And so they reject you, not because you're a bad match or because they don't like you, but precisely the opposite. They reject you or reject themselves, really. They're rejecting themselves because you're such a good match and because they like you so much. It's that fear of having your heart broken. There are a billion reasons why people push you or themselves away from you. And often it has nothing to do with you, as this says. And so this article, you know, I'm going to keep reading in a second, but this article was instrumental in showing me that rejection isn't personal. A lot of the time, the other person just has a lot going on like this, you know, not today, not today, not today. Why? I don't know, because today she's just feeling really fucking emotional. Today she just doesn't feel like doing this. She has a strong fear of, like I said, rejection or a fear of success or a fear of getting a heart broken. And she's like, I just can't deal with this today. Maybe she watched a sad movie yesterday and she's not in the mood. Maybe her best friend is going through something. Maybe her cat just fucking died. A billion different reasons. And men go through all these same reasons too. And so any women listening, if a guy just takes forever to reply your text messages or doesn't or doesn't want to see you anymore, it often isn't personal. It's often more about them than you. And that can help you have a little bit of compassion for them and a lot of compassion for yourself and not judge yourself and not beat yourself up and say, I must have done something wrong. How can I be perfect next time so that I can get the girl or get the guy? Sometimes, no matter how perfect you are, 
someone just isn't in the place or the headspace to date you or to be with you or to be a friend or whatever it is. And often if you improve yourself and be an even better product or, you know, through self-improvement, become an even more, an even better catch or whatever you want to phrase it, that scares them off even more because now they feel they have something to lose. And I have had so many coaching calls where someone says, I rejected a girl. I turned her down. I told her I don't want to date her, right? I don't want to see her. I don't want to go on a date. And I'll say, okay, cool. Like, how come? And they'll say, because I just felt like she was out of my league and I didn't feel like I'd be able to do it. Women, as you're going to see later in this article, when I keep reading, women sometimes feel the same thing. They feel like you are too good of a match for them. Maybe you're too cool or you have too much in common or the chemistry is too strong or you guys are too perfect a match in their eyes and they freak out and go, fuck, I'm going to screw this up. I don't trust myself. I don't think that I'm emotionally stable or emotionally healthy. I don't think I'm in a great place for dating someone that I would care about. So I think I should just ditch this person and go and find someone who's not as good of a match for me because at least then I don't have a fear of fucking it up. And so often you are almost too good of a match and the person won't want to be with you for that. So he goes on to say, Adriana refused to accept this explanation, and the two of them got in a fight, and Chelsea locked herself in her room. Later, the two girls made up, and Chelsea said that she didn't know why she didn't exchange numbers, and that she was dumb sometimes. She wasn't dumb. She probably just doesn't understand the hidden determinants going on in her life. She doesn't understand why she was feeling fear or whatever was going on. And so you can have the same compassion towards yourself. You know, if sometimes you turn someone down and then you later on go, fuck, I don't know why I did that. Sit down, meditate on it and ask yourself with compassion instead of judgment, why did I do that? And you're just trying to find out the truth. You're not trying to judge yourself or beat yourself up or say that you should be better or something. You're saying genuinely, I am genuinely curious as to why I did that. Because if I can discover why I did that, then I can do something about it. I can start to improve it. I can next time be a little bit more open-minded or a little bit more self-compassionate or compassionate to the other person or whatever it requires. I can do something about it. So have some curiosity about this. You don't have to beat yourself up and, you know, call yourself dumb and stuff like that. Ironically, Adriana has given the same excuse. I didn't plan to give out my number when she's met a guy that she liked and couldn't explain why that happened. Yes, lots of guys do the same thing. They'll meet a really cute girl, you know, in a cafe or something, and you'll start talking, and there'll be a voice in your head that goes, fuck, man, like, we're having so much chemistry, like, should I ask her out? And then you'll go, nah, I'm not wearing my nicest clothes right now. I bet that hits some of you really hard, doesn't it? I bet some of you have been sitting in a cafe or in the gym, and you've been talking to someone, and you didn't ask them out because you were like, I'm not dressed as well as I could be right now. I haven't had a shower. I'm not wearing cologne. I didn't really brush my teeth today. Uh, she probably has a boyfriend. Uh, she probably wouldn't be interested in me. I bet you there's been plenty of opportunities. I'm calling out a lot of you, aren't I? And that's okay. I went through exactly the same thing. And there has been lots of times when I haven't made a move or done something because I'm afraid of being rejected. When I first started coaching people, there were so many times when I had an opportunity to say to someone, would you like to sign up for the coaching program? But in my brain, I was a little bit too scared to do it, or I was worried that I wouldn't be able to coach them very effectively. I was worried that they would expect too much of me or that I wouldn't be a good enough coach. And so I just didn't ask. I didn't offer, you know, coaching. And some of those people would have happily signed up for coaching, but I didn't ask. And so I completely understand freaking out in the moment. That's a very normal human behavior. You don't have to beat yourself up. All right, ladies, gentlemen, and attack helicopters, let's keep reading. The second example is even more ridiculous. And none of this is ridiculous, like, but I know what he's getting at. Maybe you could say like funny or amusing when you can look back on it. A group of seven of us went to dinner on Friday night. Two of the girls developed a crush on our server, a good looking guy that looked like Matthew McConaughey in his younger days. All right, all right, all right. For whatever reason, even though both girls were single, it was decided that it was Allison that was gonna get his number. Ooh, lucky Allison. The two flirted back and forth the entire time. When we were set to leave, the server put his number and a message on a napkin for Ali. What a boss. What an absolute legend. I like this guy. The note said, and this is very close to what it said, Nice meeting you. I'm in trouble for flirting with you, smiley face. Cute. <laughs> so I can't let the boss see me trade numbers. Here is mine. Text me, blah, blah, blah. There's the number, and I'll call you later. Ryan. 
What a boss. Pretty smooth. He's telling her exactly what to do and he'll handle it. Maybe he reads this blog. Yeah, maybe. On the way out of this place, we actually pass by Ryan and we all say nice meeting you. Thank you. As we head out the door. Not Ali though. For some reason, she isn't speaking to him anymore. None of us knew why. We actually were going to invite him to meet up with us later that night since he seemed like a cool guy. But Ali wasn't interested anymore. Uh-oh. She had crumpled up the napkin with his info and tossed it in the trash. Everybody began asking her why she got all cold towards him and why she threw his number in the trash. The plot thickens, ladies and gentlemen. This was her explanation. I'm slightly paraphrasing. Who does that? Like, who gives their number on a napkin and tells someone to call them or something? That's just weird. I'm not taking his number, but I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Very emotional reaction, isn't it? And that's the point. You know, she's a human being, lots of you. I'm going to assume all of you, but let's just play it safe and say lots of you are human beings. Some of you might be robots or NPCs or lizard people, but most of you are human beings. <laughs> most of you are human beings. And this is what human beings do sometimes. It's not even personal. It's not you that's being emotional. It's just part of being a human being. You were given the programming of a human being. You were raised as a human being by other human beings. And part of what you were taught through that process is sometimes you're emotional. Sometimes you're not fully rational and that's okay. And so this was her being perhaps irrational. And even the word irrational is just a label. She was being perfectly rational if you understand her behavior or if you sat down and talked to her about it and said, okay, like, why did you do this? And saying that in a very non-judgmental way. And maybe it would come out something like, well, you know, I'm just really afraid of what other people might think of me. What if other people think that it's weird that he wrote his number on a napkin? What if other people judge me? What if other people say that that's strange? You know, what if people call me a slut for sleeping with some guy that I met in a restaurant? Uh, what if there's some other guy that I actually have a bigger crush on and by going out with this guy, I'm missing out on him. Like there will be reasons why she did this. She might not even be fully aware of them. And so she might have to do some digging and some meditating, but there'll be reasons why she did this. She's not irrational. It seems irrational. And sometimes we use the word irrational or emotional, but that really just means we don't understand it yet. But if you get in there and have a think about it and do some meditating on it and talk through it and process through it. There is always a reason or usually multiple reasons why you have done what you have done. You're not stupid. There's not something wrong with you. You're not fucked up. You've done it for reasons. And so if you get in there and figure out what those reasons are, as I said before, you can then choose differently in the future because now you understand and now you're not just an irrational person who doesn't really know why they do what they do. Let's keep reading. 35 minutes later, we arrive at a party and Allison is in the process of calling a taxi because as she now explains, she's now willing to go back to the restaurant and dig through the trash since she apparently liked Ryan so much and realized that she shouldn't have been an idiot, that's her words, and tossed his number. Yes, gentlemen and ladies, there will be times that you hit on someone or you're talking to someone or you go on dates with someone or maybe you're even dating someone and it doesn't work out. And you think, oh, they must hate me or they mustn't like me or maybe we're just not a good match. They might be fucking Allison. I mean, not like fucking her as in having sex with her, but they might be Allison. They might be this fucking girl. They might be exactly like this. They might like you and they accidentally deleted your number or threw it out or had an irrational moment where they go, fuck all men or fuck all women or whatever. And then 20 minutes later, they're going, oh my God, what the hell did I just do? And so it might not have anything to do with you. It might not be personal. Psycho. She's not a psycho. She's a very normal human being. This is a very normal human being thing to do. Claire, sitting right there, says the rest of the story went like this. And don't worry, this story has a cute little happy ending. Or does it? It might have an M. Shyamalan twist right at the end. We'll see. I've just spoiled it. It has a twist. Sorry for spoiling it, but you'll get there. We got back to the restaurant and Ali, who's drunk, runs to the trash can and begins digging through it. She literally takes all the trash out of it, but still can't find his number. We then went into the restaurant and I had her wash her hands and put herself back together and stop crying. Isn't this cute? Don't you just want to give her a big hug and a kiss on the forehead and be like, you're okay. Everything's okay. After about 10 minutes, she settled down, settles down and gets a phone call from another girl 
While she's talking to this other girl, I go into the restaurant and I find Ryan. He's happy to see me and he gives me his number again to give to Allison. Isn't Chris, the guy who wrote this article, isn't he such a, a wingman? Isn't he such a decent human being? That's so nice of him. He's happy to see me, gives me the number. He also says, I hope I see her again. And he even asks if she would actually go for him because he didn't think he was good enough to get a girl like her. So do you see how Ryan, this guy who wrote his number down on a napkin, he's probably sitting in there, or it looks like he is sitting in that restaurant or working in that restaurant going, oh, I bet she wouldn't like me. I bet that she probably is too good for me. And why would she get with a guy like me? And if it wasn't for Chris and all of them going back to this restaurant and getting his phone number again, he would have never spoken to this girl ever again and just assumed, oh, she mustn't like me. Meanwhile, she's digging through the freaking trash outside to try and find your number. And you would just never know that. And this isn't necessarily an extreme isolated example. It might seem like a crazy story. Sure, it is a little bit comical and adorable and funny. But there will be people in your own life that maybe turned you down or didn't want to be friends with you or said no to a date or broke up with you that then later on are essentially digging through the proverbial trash can going, holy fuck, I wish that I hadn't done that. Because human beings can be very emotional in the moment. And sometimes we do things that later on we go, oh crap, I wish I'd made a different decision. So Chris goes on to say, then I went back into the bathroom to tell Ali the good news. She was happy and we leave. The rest of the night, Ali is on cloud nine and she's even telling everyone that she met a special guy at dinner. Isn't that adorable? Here's the M. Shyamalan twist. Later that night, she deletes his number from her and my cell phone and explains, he probably thinks I'm a freak since I somehow lost his number and you had to ask again. Do you see what I'm saying about how sometimes human beings will supposedly reject you, but really they're rejecting themselves because of social pressure, because they're scared of being judged, because they judge themselves and then they're terrified that you will judge them too. She is the one that thinks she's a freak because she lost his phone number and Chris had to ask again. He doesn't think that. And I bet you $10,000 trillion if she was to ask this guy, do you think I'm a freak because I lost your number and then had to get my friend to ask you the phone number again? What he would probably say, which I'm sure a lot of you would say is, oh my God, that is the most flattering thing I've ever heard. You literally came back to the restaurant to ask for the number again. Are you serious? That's incredible. That means a lot to me. Wow, I didn't actually think you liked me that much. I really liked you too. I thought we had some great chemistry. This can be a cute little story that we laugh about and tell our friends. And if we end up building something together for a long time, then we can tell our grandkids and our kids this cute little story of how you lost the phone number because you had a little freak out. Then you dug through the trash and then you had to get your friend to come and ask me for the phone number again. That would be a cute little, like what's called a cute meet. You know, where two people, two characters meet each other in a romantic comedy. This will be the world's cutest meet. But she is the one that says she's a freak. And then she's projected that onto him and said he probably thinks that. And so all of this is very normal human behavior. Human beings can sometimes be very emotional, can be very emotionally reactive. And so again, guys and girls, if somebody turns you down or doesn't want to be with you, sometimes it is exactly like this story. Sometimes they literally want to be with you, but they're so terrified that you won't want to be with them. That's what this is. He probably thinks I'm a freak. And so I'm going to delete his number and not contact him again. There will be people in your past, all of you listening, who've had people turn you down or say no. Some of those people will have turned you down because they were worried you were going to turn them down first. And so they said, you can't fire me, I quit. Or they were afraid that you were going to be too good for them, or that you were going to think less than them, or that you were going to have power over them because you were confident and non-needy, and they felt themselves being very needy. And so they thought, fuck, this person's going to use me or have power over me. People reject each other, and more to the point, they reject themselves, which is what this is. He probably thinks I'm a freak, that's her rejecting herself, before he's even had a chance to tell her how he fucking feels. She's assumed how he feels. People reject themselves because sometimes they are terrified that you're too good for them or you're too tall for them or too handsome or too this or too powerful or too strong or too much money or too hot or too cool or too interesting or too confident or too peaceful, like too anything. And so it's not always about you, which was kind of the point of this article was a gentle reminder that it's not always about you and you didn't always do something wrong 
You know, one of the most common questions that I get from people is, a girl didn't want to date me again. What did I do wrong? And it's like, maybe you did everything right. Like this Ryan guy did everything right. I don't know what more this gentleman could have done. And because he was so calm and gentle and peaceful and happy and just grateful to get her or to give him, to give her his number. And he was charming and he was funny and he was confident and he was masculine and he took the lead and all of that. She thought like, wow, this guy's too good for me. He probably thinks I'm a freak because I forgot his number and I had to ask for it again. So he's too good for me or I'm not good enough for him. I'll turn him down, which is why I say all the time, something that helps so much in dating and everything else is self-love, self-confidence and self-love. You can work on that by doing the exercise of saying, I love you to yourself in the mirror. You can write a list of 50 things about yourself that are likable. You can read this book. This is one of my favorite books. It's called, I Need Your Love, Is That True? This is literally a book on self-love and not needing other people and not putting pressure on other people for your happiness and all of that. You know, if this woman had read this book, she would probably love herself a little bit more and maybe she wouldn't have rejected herself because that's what this statement is. This is a self-rejection. He thinks I'm a freak. You don't know that. You think you're a freak and then you've just assumed that he would agree with you. So yeah, all of that helps. Self-love helps. Later this week, Ali was texting Claire to see if she somehow still had Ryan's number and that she was so dumb for losing it, aka getting rid of it, two times. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of the Bible quote or the thing that Jesus said in the Bible when he was on the cross and he said, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. You can kind of say the same thing here. Forgive Ali. She knows not what she does. She's just kind of acting on instinct and emotion. And then afterwards, she's like, fuck, what's wrong with me? You know, it's not personal. She didn't reject you. She rejected herself twice. To our knowledge, they never spoke again and never will. To the pickup artist world, this kind of beta behavior or language might seem like it would kill your attraction, blah, blah, blah. So they're basically talking, actually, let's skip all this bit. It's not quite relevant to this article. Let's jump straight to this point. Since you don't know Allison, you might think that she's a freak and a psychopath based on her behavior. Yeah, like you might have some judgments on that sort of stuff. But anyway, he keeps going on to say, I don't blame you. And actually, I suggest that you hold that assumption since after all, you can absolutely go by first impressions. They're correct 99% of the time when trying to make sense of human behavior. I wouldn't say she's a freak or a psychopath. She doesn't know what she's doing there. And you could definitely help her and get in there and say, okay, like, why did you reject him? Like, what's going on? What made you reject him? And why do you think that he thinks you're a freak? More to the point, why do you think that you're a freak? Why do you think that you're unlovable or not good enough? Why do you think that he's better than you or that anyone else could be better than you? You could get in there and work with all that. Obviously, that's not your job if you're just some random guy who's trying to date someone. But yes, she's not a freak. She's not a psychopath. There are reasons for why she's doing what she's doing. And I say that because some of you might have turned people down. You probably have turned people down rejected them, said you don't want to see them. And then afterwards you go, was I being too harsh? Why did I do that? And it's worth getting in there and saying, okay, non-judgmentally, I'm going to ask myself why I actually did that. Why did I do that? And have a curious mindset and get in there and figure it out because that can help you when you make decisions in the future. He goes on to say, I can tell you based on my experience of knowing Ali for four years and sleeping with her for about three months in 2010, she's one of the most drama-free girls I've met in Los Angeles to this day. Ali would fall into the 1% of girls that isn't a depressed oddball despite the incident. I would not say 99% of women are depressed oddballs, but each to their own. But the point here that he's making is he found her to be quite a rational person and when it comes to matters of the heart of like dating and stuff like that particularly when someone meets something someone that they really like or they really have a connection with all of that attachment and that fear of loss and that neediness and that you know scarcity mindset of holy shit i found someone that i really like i better not screw this up fuck what if they reject me what if they think i'm a freak it can cause you to act very irrationally which is why I talk a lot about self-love. I talk about building a winner's mindset. You know, you can grab my play to win video course, where I literally talk about how to build an, an abundance mentality mindset, how to build a very self-loving mindset. All of these sort of things help, you know, stoicism, independence, 
learning to put yourself first and love yourself first, all of that helps. But when it comes to matters of sex, dating and relationships or matters of the heart, yes, people can act very, very emotionally and people that are normally very rational in every other area of their life can become very emotional and very knee jerk reactionary to everything that happens in their dating life. It's almost like they become a completely different person because they're terrified of loss. You know, the whole of society tells you that you will only be happy if you have someone else that loves you. And the only place that you can get love is romantic love. That's basically what everyone in society tells you. If you want the antidote to that, read this book. I need your love. Is that true? And all of my content, I talk about loving yourself first. You don't have to get love from someone else, blah, blah, blah. But the point is most people will tell you brainwash you, I guess you could say, or program you. And it's not nefarious, but it's programming to tell you that you need a partner. Otherwise, there's something wrong with you. You need someone else to love you. Otherwise, there's something wrong with you. And the only place you can be happy or get happiness is from someone else. That's what most people believe. It's the great lie that, you know, humanity likes to tell itself or doesn't even know that it's telling itself. But that's where that comes from. And so with that, you can see why you would have a lot of fear of missing out. You can see why you would act seemingly irrationally when it comes to dating and sex and relationships, because you're terrified that this person that you really like, or you have a connection with might be your one true shot at happiness. And when you look at all the movies and the songs and the books and the TV shows and Disney movies that tell you, you have one soulmate and you're looking for the one Anytime you meet someone that you have some sort of connection with, your brain starts going, holy fuck, is this the one? I better not screw this up. And of course, it's basically guaranteed that you will either reject them or reject yourself or fumble it or, you know, fuck it up. Not that you can ever fuck it up, but you'll call it fucking it up because you'll be hard on yourself, but you will so-called fuck it up. Because you're like, this is my one shot of happiness. This is the one person. I better not screw this up. That sounds like impossible conditions for dating. And so this is why I say, give yourself permission to suck. This is why I say, embrace honesty and authenticity. This is why I say, self-love and independence come first. This is why I say, dating and sex and relationships are a numbers game. You probably are not going to end up with the very first person that you have a connection with. That's just statistically unlikely. Most people don't stay in the first relationship that they ever have, especially if most people have a relationship in high school. It's very unlikely that that lasts for the rest of one or both of your lives. And so all of that, all of those philosophies can help take some of that pressure off you that you have to, you know, do a perfect job. And so this alley girl probably had some of those stories. You know, I have this connection with this guy and I really like him. I better not screw this up. I better not let him think I'm a freak. I better not fuck this up. That is what I call playing not to lose. You're like, God, I hope I don't lose. I better not lose. But we here are here to play to win. We're trying to have a victory. We're trying to have something beautiful or build something beautiful. And so we're not even thinking about losing, about losing. If somebody leaves or doesn't want to be with you, awesome. We're so focused on the victory and winning and having a great time and finding the people that want to have a great time with us that we don't mind if someone doesn't want to be with us or they leave. We don't even care if the one, so to speak, comes along into our life and then we fuck it up. What do we give a shit? We'll go talk to the next one. There's lots of ones. There's lots of soulmates. There are so many beautiful human beings on this planet. Do you really think there's one person that you can build a connection with? God, no. There are so many millions, maybe even billions of people that you can form a loving, great, amazing, beautiful connection with. Not everybody. Not everybody's going to want the same thing as you, but there are so many beautiful candidates and it doesn't have to be the first person that comes along that has some sort of connection with you that you end up being with forever. So all of that can help take some of that pressure off. But Ali is not, to be clear, a freak. She's not a psychopath. None of that. She's a human being who, like many of you, has put all this pressure or had this pressure put on her that she has to do a really good job with dating and a really good job with sex and a really good job with relationships. And she can't have too much sex because then she's a slut, but she can't wait too long because then she's a prude and she has to keep up appearances and she has to be pretty and feminine and do a great job and be interesting and cool and charismatic and sweet and nice and kind to people. And she has to be polite and she has to do everything she's told and she can't color too far outside the lines and she has to follow all of society rules and she has to be politically correct and she has to have social decorum and oh my fucking God, is that not enough to blow your fucking 
your brain up with overthinking. Yes, that's why a lot of you overthink and beat yourselves up and put all this pressure. That's why I say the antidote is giving yourself permission to suck. Let all of that go and surrender to the fact that you might not always be perfect with dating, especially if you haven't done it very much. It might be something that you're not very good at for a long period of time. You can reframe that and say, you know what, I'm good enough and I'm going to slowly work on getting a little bit better. But the point is you might not be some smooth James Bond, Casanova, alpha male, sigma male, right off the bat, it might take you a little while to warm up and learn some social, you know, conversation skills. It might take you a little while to learn how to be decent at sex. It might take you a little while to learn to let go of the fear of heartbreak and rejection and all of that. It might take you a little while to build some of that beautiful abundance mentality or that self-love. All of these things might take time. Honesty is something that might take a little bit of time and practice to work towards. It took me years to be where I am right now, where I can be honest most of the time. And I'm still not always perfectly honest. I try, but the goal is, you know, to keep improving at it rather than to be some idealistic perfection idea. You're probably not going to be that. So Ali's doing a good job. All of you are doing a good job too. I promise. We don't know how Ryan interpreted the situation. Uh, from having coached hundreds of men like Ryan, Ryan probably, and I can't know, but Ryan probably interpreted this situation as, yeah, see, I knew it. I knew I wasn't good enough for this alley chick. See, another girl that rejected me. It's because I don't have enough muscle or I'm too short or I'm Asian or I'm ugly or I'm this. Just like how a lot of you have those narratives running in your head and you use stories like this as confirmation. You'll give some girl your phone number, she won't text you and you'll go, I knew it, it's because I'm ugly. And lots of you women will do the same thing too. Some guy will get your phone number or you'll text for a little bit or you'll date and he'll do something like this. And then you'll go, yep, see, I knew it. it's because I'm unlovable, I'm unworthy. No, a lot of the time it has more to do with the other person and nothing to do with you. In fact, you might have even been almost too good a match for them to the point where that fear of missing out kicks in and they're terrified of losing their soulmate or someone they have a great connection with. And so they run away before you can reject them. I have had so many coaching clients or so many conversations with coaching clients where they literally tell me that they've turned someone down before that person had a chance to turn them down because they were terrified this person would be too good for them and they'd rather just get it over with now and say, you know, go away, I don't want to be with you. Imogen, my girlfriend of six and a half years, had this at the start. For the first like six months, maybe the first nine months, she was utterly terrified. Actually, it was probably longer than that. It was probably the first two years. She was so terrified that at some point I was going to like leave her behind as in I was going to go too far with my self-improvement and she wouldn't be good enough for me anymore and I would have grown too fast but you know she hadn't caught up and I would have broken up with her. She was terrified of that for like the first two years and for quite a lot of it she pushed me away multiple times. Many times she would push me away, sometimes literally physically pushing me away saying I just want to be alone right now. You know, I don't want you to cuddle me. I don't want you to give me a snuggle. I don't want cons consolation. And I was obviously able to know exactly why. And I was able to explain that to her and say, you are worried that I'm going to break up with you. Like we talked about that. So I already knew that. And I was like, you're worried that I'm going to break up with you. And so you're trying to push me away before I get a chance to push you away. That's what you're terrified of. Is that correct? And she would say, yes, I think that's what it is. And so this was something she learned to overcome. So I promise it's something you can overcome. You can let go of your fears. You probably just grab my play to win video course. A lot of that stuff I talk about fear of loss and, you know, fear of rejection and all of that. I have a whole chapter on fear of rejection and then grab this book as well. I need your love. Is that true? So grab my play to win video course if you would like to, and then this book, if you would like to. So he goes on to say, you know, we don't know how Ryan interpreted the situation, but something tells me he felt like he wasn't good looking enough based on his interaction with Claire and somewhat based on how he interacted with our group. I would rephrase this bit here. I wouldn't say women know they are psychos. I'd more say like human beings know that they can be emotional sometimes and human beings don't trust themselves. A lot of human beings do not trust themselves. I've had lots of people and there'll be some of you listening right now that want to sign up for my coaching and they literally say this bit here. They literally say, Andy, I want to sign up for your coaching. I have the money or I can make a payment plan but I don't trust myself. I don't trust myself to show up and make the most of the coaching program. I don't trust myself to commit to it. I don't trust myself to be, you know, I guess you would say consistent. 
Now, I don't trust myself to put in the effort. And I say every single time, by the way, if any of you feel like that, that's what the fucking coaching program is for. I've literally designed it to hold your hand, keep you accountable, be there for you. We have accountability partners. I have so much structure in place to show you that it doesn't have to be you. In fact, if you don't trust yourself, do you not think it would be better to be in a coaching group with a whole bunch of other people that will do it for you, will literally help you so that you don't have to rely on yourself? But that's a side note. If you want the coaching, you can click the link in the description. But this is such a common thing that people feel like they don't trust themselves and they don't trust their emotions or they feel like they have a very like hair trigger anger or something like that. And they're worried that they're not emotionally stable or they're not always emotionally rational or logical. That's a very common human thing. So Chris goes on to talk about like PMS, like period. Yes, obviously period means that your hormones go up and down and women can become very emotional. Imogen will cry a lot more in the two or three days leading up to her period. And then for the first one or days, one or two days of her period, if you look into the psychology, sorry, the biology, the physiology of women's periods, you'll see their hormones go up and down like fucking crazy. It's, it's absolutely insane. But this obviously isn't just a female thing. Women are not the only ones who are emotional it's kind of a meme that's peddled is like men are the rational ones. And it's like, nah, go coach a whole bunch of men. And you'll see that like men are not as rational as we pretend to be. You can become very rational and peaceful, but no, men are, <laughs> men just don't have periods. And so it appears like we're more rational, but no, men can be very emotional. And that's not a judgment. That's not a bad thing. Everybody's doing their best. And to be very clear, emotions are not a bad thing. And I will say it for the 10,000th time, if you want to be more emotionally stable, grab my beautiful video course, Play to Win, How I Built a Winner's Mindset. You can pay whatever you want for that. You can even pay $1 for it if you would like to. But this is literally about how to be more emotionally resilient. There's a whole chapter on resiliency and stuff like that, how to be more peaceful, basically. So the big difference is the emotionally stable ones, he's talking about women, but it's really more like humans, take better control of their mind and they have more respect for the people that are around them. They also know that they can't necessarily trust how they feel about certain issues, especially men, or you could say, especially dating and romance and love and all of that. And they refrain from making any rash decisions until the feelings pass. Yes, that's essentially stoicism is noticing your feelings. And again, this is what I talk about in the play to win video course. It's noticing your feelings and then saying, okay, I've got these feelings. I'm going to think about this rationally and nice and calm. And I won't judge the feelings. It's okay that I'm emotional right now. It's okay that I feel a bit irrational. That's okay. But I'll think a little bit before I make a decision or I'll talk to some friends or I will do what I call putting in a pause. So if you're someone that is prone to emotionality when it comes to dating and sex, if you're someone that gets really butt hurt or something and you reply with like very angry texts to people, I've had a few coaching clients that have felt like this. What I say is put in a pause and so literally hit the pause button and say, I will not reply to this for 12 hours or 24 hours or whatever. And sometimes you can text the person and say, hey, I'm super busy. I'll reply later, you know, but then pause for 12 hours or 24 hours. Think about it and then send your text. And the clients that I've got to do this, like I've gotten them to do this, they have found that it just makes them so much more rational if they just wait until the feelings pass. And a saying that can really help when you're feeling very emotional is this too shall pass, that can help. Or you can say, I'm feeling very emotional right now, and that's okay. You don't have to get rid of your emotions. You don't have to bottle them up. In fact, I would turn towards them and feel them and let them run their course. You know, don't try and hide away from them. Emotions can be incredibly useful and help you. They're often, and helpful. They're often trying to tell you something. And so you don't have to run away from your emotions. He goes on to say, the less emotionally healthy chicks, or really more like the less emotionally healthy people, freak out, swear they know what they want. They get into fights with their friends or more than friends. They sometimes want to take it all back after the week is over. They repeat the exact same process every month, it seems. Sometimes a post-mortem explanation is, I'm sorry, it was my time of the month, or you know, I'm sorry, I was going through some struggles or something is offered, but not always, or usually not. It's actually surprising that more suicides don't occur. When emotions slash mood are affected, so too is the decision-making process. Women, I'd say people, not boldly decisive creatures to begin with. People are not boldly decisive creatures to begin with. 
are left in a thorough state of confusion and indecision since their emotions are constantly changing but always seem real. That's just humans. That's just a human thing. Again, having worked with as many men as I've worked with, several hundred at this point, men are just as irrational as women. They're just much better at hiding it, much better at bottling it up. I think they're much better at pretending or giving the uh, appearance of rationality and logic. But men are absolutely beautifully emotional creatures as well. It's just that women tend to share their emotions and men tend to be very afraid of their emotions and none of that is a judgment obviously i will say it again emotions and irrationality or seeming irrationality is not a bad thing having feelings makes you human yes you can over time become a lot more peaceful again for the 10,000th time my play to win video course literally talks about how to win as, how to build a winner's mindset or how to be more stoic and rational and calm but Having emotions is a very human trait. Yes, I promise you can get to a point where you feel nothing but, or almost nothing, but peace and love and joy. I'm in that place maybe 90% of the time. It's a very beautiful place. The world is a lot friendlier and kinder when you feel like that. So I promise that is what is possible. Again, that video course helps with that. So does all of Byron Katie books, David Hawkins. I've done plenty of content on peace and happiness and being a lot more calm. But yes, it's a very human trait to have constantly changing emotions unless you do something about it or learn some peace and some stoicism and some calm. Most people literally have no idea what they want for the first 20 to 25 years of their life. Again, he's saying all these are women things, but this is just humanity things. Most men have no idea what they want for the first 20 to 25 years of their life. They use society's blueprint. I've done videos on how most people follow society's blueprint. You know, get an average nine to five job, have a wife or a husband and two kids, have a white picket fence, have a house, get a mortgage, go to university, like just do what everyone else is doing. Get the vaccine, wear a mask, stay inside, socially distance 1.5 meters, all of that kind of stuff. You know, vote for whichever person, vote for whichever one of the two parties makes you less annoyed than the other one. You know, don't ever vote for an independent, don't ever not vote at all. Like basically society has sort of a blueprint. And that's not a bad thing. You know, again, I've done a video or plenty of videos about why most people follow society's blueprint. It's because it keeps you relatively safe, relatively comfortable, relatively complacent. So most people use society's blueprint in order to fit in, to guide them to success or a midlife. And then they have some sort of crisis. Yeah, like that's, yes. To see that Chelsea and Ali rejected and regretted rejecting guys that they should be getting fucked by right now is not entirely surprising. It happens all the time. Yes, human beings do that a lot, don't they? Reject people that they're actually interested in. Sometimes I see it happening right before my eyes and I literally tell the girl, no, you're putting... Oh, okay, he's saying sometimes he will be hitting on a woman and she's like rejecting herself. I get it. And he'll say, no, you're putting my number, your number in my phone. You like me. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. It works out more than you might think, especially on the girls that are kind of shy and only kind of like me. So I personally don't tell people, like I wouldn't tell, but I understand, you know, when he's saying this, he probably has a smile on his face. And, you know, he's he was a very jovial, joking, friendly kind of guy. So understand the energy behind it is not forceful. He's not like, no, bitch, you're putting your phone number in my phone. You like me. Don't you dare fight this. No, it's more like, come on, girl. Like, we both know you like me. It's okay. It's more like a fatherly gentle yeah i usually like i wouldn't do this but i have had plenty of times yes where i can see a woman literally rejecting herself i just told you all that imogen did that for the first couple of years and so i will always talk to them and i'll say okay like whoops i just hit pause on the video i'll talk to them and i'll say all right what's going on like do you want to date me do you want to go out do you want to do this are you just a little bit scared like you can talk to me it's okay i've been scared of stuff too would you like to talk about this and i found that most human beings do want to talk about it and they are just afraid and they have a fear of you know failure or a fear of rejection or a fear of looking stupid or a fear of being a slut or a fear of being a pervert or a fear of being creepy you know women a lot of women are afraid of being a slut guys are afraid of being creepy you know so whatever you might be afraid of and you can talk through that. And a lot of shy people, yeah, as he says here, a lot of shy people will talk through it and they'll be very grateful that you listen to them. And they'll be like, thank you. I'm really glad we had this conversation. Obviously, that's how Imogen feels. She's very grateful 
that we had all those conversations and I was able to help her stick around because that's what she wanted. She was just very afraid. This type of erratic behavior and fleeting emotions can also occur outside of, you know, PMS periods. Yes, like I said, it's a human thing. Uh, simply because women have a more emotional response to stimuli than men do. Again, I don't even believe that anymore. I used to believe that. I think that's like a cute little story that men tell where we say like, we're the rational ones and women are the emotional ones. Again, I think women are more likely to be obvious with their emotions. They will cry. They might get a little bit more scared of things. They might make their emotions a little bit more apparent, but men absolutely have an emotional response. It's just that they'll call it logic. Men will often use testosterone and anger. They will use that or they will mask that with the label of rationality. And so men will often say, no, I'm being rational right now, while they're being as irrational and angry as you ever might imagine, but they'll call that rationality. And then they'll see a woman who's crying and they'll say, she's being emotional, she's irrational. So I think it's a cute story. It just doesn't really gel with my lived experience. Again, from having coached literally hundreds of men over the last, you know, six or seven years, men can be very emotional. They just tend to bottle it up. So a better statement or a more accurate statement here is women's emotions are very apparent. Men's emotions are often very hidden and under the surface. Who is more likely to commit suicide? Men at a rate of like 90% or something compared to women, especially workplace, you know, suicides and deaths and all of that. Men are very emotional creatures and it is the I think it's stories like this that, you know, women are the emotional ones and men are not the emotional ones. I think stuff like that leads to more male suicide because then when you do have emotions, which every single man does, when you have emotions, you're scared of them. You're like, holy fuck, there must be something wrong with me. I must be a fucking pussy. I'm going to put a gun in my mouth. And so if you are a man and you have emotions, I promise that is very normal. That is one thing that we teach the guys in our coaching group. We're like, look, if you have emotions, if you have feelings, beautiful. Fucking talk to us about those things so we can process them, learn from them. Again, your emotions and your feelings are often trying to tell you something. They're often really useful information. If something is continually pissing you off and making you really angry, that is often a sign that you don't want to continue down that path. And so it's worth changing something and learning from it. If you're constantly sad or grieving or feeling depressed, that is, again, a really useful piece of information that maybe you're not happy with your life. We can learn from that, but when you bottle that up, you can't learn from it. When you say emotions are bad or you label your feelings as being a pussy or being a coward or not being masculine enough, you're literally denying reality and denying some useful information that could serve you and help you become the man or the person that you want to be. So yeah, anyway, that's a complete side note. Human beings can often have fleeting emotions that change is a more accurate statement of that. And he goes on to give some examples. Girls can watch a sad movie and get depressed for a week. Yes, guys can have a girl not reply to them and be sad for a week and depressed. And so you see how lots of these things are more like human qualities rather than just women. I have coached so many men and so many of you listening come to the live streams and ask these kind of questions where you're like, Man, I feel like such a pussy. Again, there's that self-judgment. I feel like such a pussy, dude, because this girl that I'm texting, she didn't reply to me for three days. And bro, I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. It's like, oh, I thought that emotions were just a female thing. No, men feel emotions too. So yeah, guys do the same shit. Men are romantic as well. Like, you know, men can watch a romantic comedy and then fall in love the next week. Men can watch a romantic comedy and be like, God damn, I just want a wife and a kid. Like... If you ask the vast majority of men what they want, it's not to get laid. That's almost just like a short-term goal. If you say, what do you actually want? They're like, I just want a woman to that I can love and we can build a family together and maybe have some kids. I just want a woman who adds to my life and I add to hers. Like men are fucking romantic too. So all of this is him sort of talking more about human qualities, but at the same time, you know, I hope none of this comes across as a criticism. I'm definitely not criticizing his focus on women. I'm just pointing out that for those of you women listening or for those of you men listening, it can help to realize that both genders feel a lot of the same emotions. We're all human beings at the end of the day, and that can help you feel a little bit less alone. If I'm trying to build a connection with someone, which is why you're all here, 
working on your sex and dating lives, if that's what you're working on. You're here because you want to build connections with women. If I'm trying to build a connection with someone, I focus on the similarities, not the differences. And so I like to look at how we're all humans and what we have in common, rather than saying women are slightly different in this case or men are slightly different in this case. I'd rather focus on the similarities and come together. I mean, literally come together. <laughs> so he goes on to say, you know, lots of people have no idea what triggers their emotions. Only a certain percentage do in hindsight. Yes, the vast majority of human beings are not uh, self-aware. Self-awareness is something you have to train. It's something you have to learn. Understanding your brain and your emotions and how it all works and understanding psychology and biology and evolution and all of that stuff. All of that requires learning and knowledge and understanding. The vast majority of people have not done that. And that's not their fault. Just they, they didn't know that shit existed. Lots of people see self-help or self-improvement as like a scam or some hippie nonsense or something. And so most people just don't understand their own emotions. They don't know how their brain works. They don't realize that they're stuck in anger. They almost, you know, again, it's that Jesus quote of like, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. They literally don't realize. I used to be like that for years, for like 10 years. That's why I was depressed and suicidal. I literally didn't understand how my brain worked. I didn't understand how my emotions worked. And I was almost a slave to it, running on instinct. And so when you can see that the vast majority of people are innocent in that, like it's not by choice. They don't want to be angry. They just don't know how to not be angry. They don't know how to be peaceful. They don't know how to be self-aware. When you realize that you can start to take it a lot less personally. And if somebody gets angry at you or rejects you or says no, you don't take it so personally because you say they might just not know any better. They might not know how to be self-aware. They can learn it. But as he goes on to say, it sure as hell is not your job to guess, analyze, or play therapist. It's not your job to, I mean, you can if you want to. You can mentor people if you want to. But if you don't want to, you have no obligation to help other be, people be self-aware. I personally like to because that's what brings me a lot of joy. I like to be a coach. I like to be someone of, I guess you would say, almost compassion, like trying to help other people as much as I can and all of that. But you're under no obligation. If you don't like the way that somebody is treating you, that's okay. You can have love and in your heart and compassion and then walk away like you're allowed to. You can say, hey, that's okay. They don't know what they're doing or maybe they don't know any better. But I sure as hell, I'm not going to spend my time with them. That's, you know, you can do whatever you would like. I really like this next sentence. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, there isn't a database in Washington that has a record of why you got rejected. And so you'll never know what the real reason is. Yes, this makes the point. As I've said several times in this video, sometimes people will turn you down because you were too good of a match for them, or they were too intimidated by you, or they were worried that you were too good for them. And so you don't know why someone has rejected you, and yet lots of you will take it personally. And you ask me questions like, what did I do wrong? You probably didn't do anything wrong. And the final thing he says is, I can guarantee you though, if you can somehow make yourself above average looking, like you only need to be slightly above average looking. I mean, hell, you can be average looking. I actually don't even think you need to be above average looking, but go for above average looking. You won't be getting rejected for your looks. Not too often anyway. There will largely just be available versus not available people. At least you will convince yourself. You'll find out by touching them. So this is something that I definitely disagree with what he advocates for. And I think he's even changed his mind on this. Again, he wrote his articles like 12 years ago. I don't recommend you touch strangers. You know, I like to ask if I'm going to touch someone. Yo, can I kiss you? You know, yo, can I hold your hand? Stuff like that. But basically he's saying you will find out if someone is available by asking them if they're available, by asking them out and seeing what happens. So yeah, I like this little article. This was one of the articles that helped me a lot. Again, it's called What Do Women Want? They Have No Idea sexually unavailable for unexplained reasons. And a lot of gratitude goes out to Chris from Good Looking Loser. This guy helped me a whole lot when I first started working on my sex and dating life. And he's a big reason why I'm sitting here helping all of you. A big part of the username that I have or the, I guess you would say community name that I have, you know, Kill Your Inner Loser, that came from him. A lot of the mindsets and philosophies that I live by even still to this day came from him. My dedication to self-improvement, and I guess you could say self-esteem and self-love, came very much from him. And so I will always be very grateful to him.
And just as a final takeaway, a final summary, sometimes people will turn you down or say no to you or really say no to themselves for reasons that had nothing or very little to do with you. And so that's why I say you don't have to take it personally. It's okay if you do take it personally, you don't have to judge that. But it often isn't, maybe most of the time, it isn't personal. As long as you've done your best to look as good as you possibly can, and that might mean losing a little bit of weight, it might mean going to the gym, dressing a little bit better, throwing on some accessories, any of these things. You've worked on your appearance a little bit, you've worked on your self-confidence a little bit, which is really just talking to lots of people and practicing, and you'll eventually get decent at it. You've worked on your social skills a little bit, which is just practice again. You've worked on having a sort of interesting life, you know, some sort of hobby, some sort of passion, some sort of thing that brings you a little bit of joy. You don't have to have the world's craziest life, but just work on that a little bit. You've worked on your self-love and compassion and maybe just your compassion to other human beings. You have a relatively positive mindset. You don't have to be captain positive all the time. You don't have to be a peaceful Buddhist monk. But if you've just worked on all of these things just a little bit, you know, worked on having some friends as well, so you have a bit of a social life. If you've just worked on these things a little bit, I promise you, most of the time, you won't be getting rejected for personal reasons. A lot of the time, it will just be the other person wasn't available. Or maybe they thought you were too good of a match, like you see in this story. Maybe they just weren't fucking single, or they had a boyfriend, or they're just not ready to date, or they don't want to date people that came up to them on the street, or they're just not really serious about the dating apps, they're just kind of fucking around. Or maybe they have some other guy that they have a crush on, and they're kind of waiting to see how things go with him. A lot of the time, it doesn't really have a lot to do with you. And so focus on the variables that you can control. What you can control is your own self-improvement and how many people that you talk to. You can play the numbers game and keep improving yourself. You cannot control how other people respond or react to you. That's never in your control. So focus on the things that you can control, self-improvement and talking to more people. Dedicate yourself to both of those things as best as you can. If you want more help with that, I obviously have coaching. I have my play to win video course that I mentioned a few times. There's links in the description to all of that. I would love to help you in whatever way you would like me and the other coaches to help you. We have payment plans for the coaching program, so don't let money be an excuse. All of that is down below. I promise you, if you just keep improving, this applies to men and women, if you keep improving and just go talk to more people, some of them will really, really like you. And some of them you will build a beautiful connection with. But don't worry about the ones who don't want you or aren't interested in what you're offering is maybe a kinder way of saying that. Go out and find the people that want what you have to offer and want to share that with you.